girls. Uh, today, I'm going to share with you the story, Nothing Ever Happens on 90th Street, by Ronnie Schroeder and Kristen Brooker. Um, and these people, what I love about their story is that it takes this young girl, Eva, and it walks her through her writing of a story. And Eva is having a challenge coming up with ideas that make things interesting. She feels like 90th Street is super ordinary. Nothing ever happens there. How is she supposed to write something good? And she wants to be a writer. So how do we take a story from ordinary to extraordinary? How do we elaborate to keep our readers interested? Pick the right spots to really give good details and information. Stretch your story. And finally, sensory details. How do we get your reader to taste, touch, smell, see what you, the writer, want them to see? So they're making that movie in their head. So as I read Nothing Ever Happens on 90th Street, I want you to pay attention to how Eva gets ideas, how she takes the ordinary and turns it into extraordinary, how does she elaborate, and how does she use sensory details. And if that's like, whoa, too much, no worries. I'm going to go over those things in writers and probably readers also, but mostly writers workshop, and I'll refer back to this. So if you miss it today, I'll catch you up and we'll all have a good conversation about it. But bottom line is we're looking at Eva to see how a writer writes. Okay. So, <clears throat> oh, little announcement. The animals just got fed. They should be quiet, but because I'm recording something, there may be some craziness. Eva unwrapped a cinnamon danish, opened her notebook, and stared helplessly at the wide white pages. Write about what you know, her teacher, Mrs. DeMarco, had told her. So Eva sat high on the stoop and looked out over 90th Street, waiting for something to happen. A horn honked, a radio rapped, a kid cried, the usual. Nothing ever happens on 90th Street, Eva scribbled in her notebook. I like that she just even writes that down as she's stretching for ideas. A few doors down, Mr. Chen was arranging fish fillets in his newly opened seafood emporium. No one was buying, and his shop looked as empty and ignored as the tiny boarded-up store next door to it. He nodded to a woman passing by and called hello to Eva. There she is with her cinnamon danish and her notebook. And here are the denizens of her street, her neighbors, people passing by. Out the door of Eva's building came Mr. Sims, the actor carrying his enormous cat, Oliver. Mr. Sims was on hiatus, which meant out of work, in between shows, and so every day, dressed in his finest, he embarked on a daily promenade with Oliver under his arm. Writing? he asked. Trying to, Eva answered. But nothing ever happens on 90th Street. You are mistaken, my dear, Mr. Sims said. The whole world's a stage even 90th Street, and each of us plays a part. Watch the stage, observe the players carefully, and don't neglect the details, he said, stroking Oliver. Follow an old actor's advice, and you will find you have plenty to write about. Thanks, Eva said, and fast as she could using as many details as she could recall, Eva described Mr. Sims in her notebook. His felt fedora hat, his curly gray hair, his shiny button shoes. When she looked up, he was halfway down the street and Mr. Morel, Morley, the moose maker, was at his window. So here we are, and Mr. Sims has already given her some ideas. Just as he did every day, Mr. Morley set his chocolate pot and coffee urn out on his ledge with a sigh. Oops, with a sign. <laughs> Mr. Morley dreamed of having a catering business where the fanciest people demanded his dessert. But the trouble was, Mr. Morley's moose was missing something. No matter how he tried, his moose never had much taste, and Mr. Morley never had many customers. Righty, 
he asked. Mm-hmm, Eva answered, chewing on her pencil. Try to find the poetry in your pudding, Mr. Morley said softly. There is always a new way with old words. You're right, Eva said, wishing Mr. Morley would one day find the poetry in his pudding. Taking his advice, she tried to think up a new way to describe the look of Mr. Morley's moose, smooth and dark as midnight, or maybe more like mink. Yes, that was it, Eva thought, writing her notebook. The door to the building slammed, and a gust of wind sent dead leaves soaring and dipping like crazy kites. Alexis Leora nodded to Eva and stepped gracefully down the steps to do her warm-up exercises. Alexis was a dancer. When she wanted to, she could hold an extremely long leg straight up against her ear like a one-legged woman with three arms. But she couldn't smile. Eva decided it was because Alexis Leora was lonely. Writing? Alexis Leora asked Eva. Yes, Eva answered. Alexis Leora did six deep knee bends and then sighed. Stretch, she said sadly. Use your imagination. If your story doesn't go the way you want it to, you can always stretch the truth. You can ask, what if? And make up a better story. You're right, Eva said thinking, what if? What if Alexis Leora met someone? Would she smile then? What would that look like? Eva closed her eyes to try to picture it, but all she could picture was soup, Spanish soup, rich and brown and so spicy, it seemed as if she could actually smell it. Mr. Sims has Oliver, I have Dash. She could. When Eva opened her eyes, Mrs. Martinez was standing beside her. She nodded to Alexis Leora as she handed Eva a bowl of soup. Have some, she said. Writers need soup. What's your story about? Nothing much, Eva sighed. Nothing ever happens on 90th Street. Add a little action, Mrs. Martinez said. Like soup. A little this, a little that, and don't forget the spice. Mix it, stir it, make something happen. Surprise yourself. She nodded again and Alexis Leora, to Alexis Leora and went inside. Eva put down her pencil and tasted Mrs. Martinez's wonderful, surprising soup. She thought about her story. It wasn't wonderful. It wasn't surprising. But what could she do? <sighs> Nothing ever happened on 90th Street. How could she possibly add a little action and make something happen? Eva had no ideas. She was stuck. Then, Mrs. Friedman, from up the block, came wheeling baby Joshua in his stroller. He was holding a bright red ball in two tiny, fat hands. Bird, he called out to a pigeon, hunting for something to eat. Bird, hungry! Pigeon, Mrs. Friedman told him. Eva sighed and looked down at her half-eaten Danish, then at her notebook. She looked at baby Joshua, then at the pigeon. She remembered Alexis Leora's words of advice. What if? Eva thought. Suddenly, she had an idea. What if she stood up, broke her Danish into dozens of tiny pieces, and scattered them wide and wild into the street? What would happen? Eva laughed to think of it. From lampposts and legend, ledges, dozens of pigeons swooped down to dine on Danish. Eva eagerly picked up her pencil and began to write again. Bird! Baby Joshua called out, pointing. More bird! He cried, panting. The bright red ball dropped out of his tiny, fat hands and bounced onto the sidewalk. Bye-bye, ball! Baby Joshua screamed. The ball rolled off the curb, into the street, and straight into the path of a pizza delivery man on a bu his bicycle. Whoa. I love this image. I think it's one of my favorites in the whole book. Everyone gasped in horror. Alexis Leora paused in mid-plié and leapt to the rescue. 
She got there just as the pizza delivery man landed right side up at her feet. Alexis Leora looked down at the pizza man and he looked up at her and then something almost unimaginable happened. Alexis Leora smiled. Are you all right? She asked shyly. Her smile was sweet and bright. Her teeth were straight and white. It was the first time Eva or anyone on 90th Street had seen them. Yes, said the pizza man, smiling up at her. It was love at first sight. Pepperoni and peppers rained down on the happy couple. The pizza man pulled a pepper out of his hair as horns began to honk. Eva added this to her notebook and wondered what could possibly happen next. And there they are. And of course, no love story would be incomplete without parts. A long, white limousine was honking its horn loudest of all. The limo driver rolled down his window. What do you want to block traffic for? He called out. The back door of the limo opened and out stepped a woman in sunglasses wearing a turban and a coat the color of a taxi. There seems to be a problem, Henry, she said in a fake English accent. There's some sort of accident here, perhaps. It's Sandra. Someone suddenly screamed, interrupting her. Sandra, can I have your autograph? Mrs. Martinez called out. Sandra Saunderson, Mr. Morley blushed. Was Eva dreaming? There, in the middle of 90th Street, larger than life, stood Sandra Saunderson, star of stage, screen, and the sensational soap opera, One World to Live In. So there's our limousine right there. And there she is in her yellow coat and her turban. Darlings, what happened here? I'm sure I... Larry, she called out suddenly the stretch, and stretched her arms out towards Mr. Sims, who had just returned from his promenade. It's been such an age since we saw each other. Mr. Sims' cat, about to be crushed in extravagant embrace, leaped out of Mr. Sims' arms to chase after baby Joshua's ball. Oliver, Mr. Sims called out, come back. Everyone raced into the street after the ball, but it was the limo driver who, in the right place at the right time, leaned into the gutter and picked it up. And there you go. With a flick of the wrist, he tossed the ball to Mrs. Friedman, who presented it to a drooling but grateful baby Joshua. How's that for a throw? The limo driver proudly asked the crowd. No one, not even baby Joshua, had a chance to answer. Oliver, frightened by so many people, raced past Eva, scrambled onto Mr. Morley's ledge, where he knocked over the coffee urn, spilling all the coffee into his moose pot. Ruined! Mr. Morley cried, wringing his hands. At that, Oliver bounded to the top of a ginkgo tree, where he swayed dangerously like a heavy white balloon. Now he'll never come down, Mr. Sims lamented. He's terribly stubborn. There, there, Larry, Sandra Saunderson comforted him. I'm sure someone on 90th Street will have a solution. Eva tried to imagine who that could be. I have one, she heard Mr. Chang called out. Generously, he offered trout fresh from his store to Oliver. High up in the tree, Oliver barely blinked. Raw trout! Mr. Sim sighed. My regrets, Mr. Chang. He won't eat it. He is a gourmet cat. I am afraid I have spoiled him. Whatever will I do? No sushi for the cat, I guess. What if, Eva asked herself for the second time that day, and suddenly she had another idea, a truly great one. She whispered it to Mr. Morley, Mrs. Martinez, and Mr. Chen. Brilliant, Mr. Morley exclaimed. And with that, he, Mrs. Martinez, and Mr. Chen, still clutching his trout, vanished into the building. Eva righted Mr. Morley's coffee urn and stuck her finger into the, his ruined mousse, then into her mouth to determine the degree of damage. Mocha, she called out in surprise. Mr. Morley's moose is mocha now, Anne. She paused, trying to find the perfect word. Magnificent. 
she announced to the assembling throng, and giving the pot a stir, she dished out samples to all assembled. Delicious, Alexis Lira said, screaming some into the pizza man's mouth. Poetry, Sandra Saunderson pronounced. You can see what her plan has become. Now, on 90th Street, people who had never spoken to one another before were speaking at last. The pizza delivery man and the limo driver shook hands and everyone tried to tempt Oliver down from his precarious perch. And then, Mr. Morley appeared on the steps, followed by Mrs. Martinez and Mr. Chang. Mrs. Martinez carried a large pot of her surprising soup, while Mr. Morley carried a platter of Mr. Chang's trout, now surrounded by many tiny vegetables and cooked to perfection. With the addition of a cup of Mr. Morley's cat-created mocha mousse, it was a meal worthy of the finest culinary establishment. Do you smell that, Oliver? Mr. Sims called, fanning the steam, so it rose up into the ginkgo tree. Oliver took one deep sniff and bolted down the tree to dine. Everyone on 90th Street sampled each course, and everyone on 90th Street sighed with delight. Superb! Fantastico! Yum! Eva smiled and glanced up from her notebook. For the third time that day, she asked herself, what if? Mr. Chang, she began, you and Mr. Morley and Mrs. Martinez are such great cooks. The boarded up store next to your seafood emporium, what if all of you used it for a restaurant? A restaurant? The three chefs looked at one another. What a wonderful idea, they said, shaking Eva's hand. Everyone on 90th Street could be our customers. You too, Sandra. Everyone but me, Mr. Sims said regretfully. Just now, I'm between jobs and a bit low on cash. No longer, Sandra called out. You'll be on my show. I'll arrange it. Mr. Sims kissed Sandra's hand and everyone cheered. What an amazing day, Mrs. Martinez said. Who would believe it if only someone had written it all down? I did, Eva announced, and she opened her notebook and began to read her story. The same story you're reading now about how nothing ever happened on 90th Street. What a story, Sandra exclaimed, full of detail, dialogue, suspense, a bit of poetry, a hint of romance, even a happy ending. Why, you'd almost think some of it was made up. Eva smiled mysteriously. Thanks, she said proudly, but just wait. It'll be even better after I rewrite it. I think her ending is my favorite, the idea that such a lovely story needs to be revised. It can always make something better. So as you can see, Nothing Ever Happens on 90th Street's big idea is looking at how to be a writer and how to create a story that's going to engage your audience with some of these things to work on. So I'm looking forward to you thinking about that. And of course, I will post this uh, story to my Google Classroom with the question, um, what writing details did you notice that Eva used? And I'll look forward to seeing what your answers are. And those of you who are in another classroom or aren't asked that question, you can go ahead and write that in some notebook you're keeping as you aspire to be a writer. Catch you next time. Bye.